Hello, and welcome to Mission San Luis, a 17th century Spanish mission to the Appalachian Indians located in present-day Tallahassee, Florida. Today, I'd like to share with you some of the information we've learned from excavations in the military complex of the mission. As you may know, the site we've investigated is the second location of Mission San Luis. It was moved to this spot in about 1656 from its first incarnation a short distance to the east. It remained here until the end of July 1704, when this mission was burned and all of Appalachian province abandoned because of attacks and threatened attacks by the English and their Indian allies. During that period, San Luis was either the largest or almost the largest of the nearly dozen Appalachian missions. It was the Spaniards' capital town of Appalachian province, the region between the Osceola and Ocloconee rivers, and the homeland of the Appalachians. As the provincial capital, San Luis wasn't a typical mission. Not only was the mission populated by a significant number of Appalachians and a Franciscan friar or two, but it was also home to Spanish administrators, civilians, and soldiers. The first soldiers arrived in Appalachian province in 1638, five years after the first Appalachian missions had been founded. They were few in number, and their duties were split between supervising the activities of the port at San Marcos, established in 1639 at the confluence of the Wakulla and St. Mark's rivers, and watching over the Appalachian missions. When San Luis moved to this location in about 1656, the current governor envisioned a Spanish settlement along with a garrison and fortifications. By this time, Appalachian province had become not only the breadbasket for St. Augustine, but also a conduit for making profits in shipping agricultural surplus and other goods throughout the Caribbean. The chief of San Luis at that time agreed to move his village a short distance to the new location and to build a Casa Fuerte for the deputy governor of Appalachian province and his garrison. This strong house was the first fortification at Mission San Luis. San Luis would eventually grow into the second largest settlement of Spaniards in La Florida after St. Augustine. Roughly a dozen Spanish soldiers were stationed in Appalachian province when San Luis was moved, protecting both the missions and the port. The number of soldiers fluctuated over the years, but increased to between 40 and 50 by the beginning of the 18th century. There may have been as many as three fortifications at San Luis. The first was the stronghouse built by the Appalachians in about 1656. The last was the much larger blockhouse constructed between 1695 and 1697, now reconstructed at the site. One Spanish document mentions barracks constructed to house soldiers while the last fort was being built, and this may have been another fortification. A Waddle and Daw building is located about 60 meters west of the western Palisade line. We've never excavated this structure, but it could be that temporary barracks. We think that all of these fortifications were located at the northern limits of the current state-owned property. There certainly were defensive considerations. This area is one of the highest points on the ridgetop. The forts were built as far north of the town plaza as possible, while still offering ready access to the northernmost spring. Several seep springs on the edge of the hilltop were the water source for the mission. There was sometimes friction between the Franciscan friars and the soldiers. The friars thought the soldiers didn't always set the best example for the Appalachians. They were probably happy to have the soldiers as far as possible from the town center. Appalachian warriors, however, served as part of the militia 
and some Appalachian leaders were recognized with military titles like captain or sergeant. In most military expeditions from Appalachian province, the Appalachians made up the majority of the force. The primary weapon used by the Appalachians was the bow, but toward the later part of the 17th century, firearms became more available to them. During the final expeditions against the invading English and their allies, there were more Appalachian warriors carrying muskets than bows and arrows. The last strong house at San Luis was a large two-story block house constructed between 1695 and 1697. It stood alone for several years until further English threats prompted the addition of outworks. A palisade and a dry moat surrounding it were added to the complex in 1702. In 1705, the year after San Luis was abandoned, a Spanish admiral toured the region around the former mission. He drew up a map of the area that shows San Luis and it includes an inset highlighting the military complex. It depicts a substantial blockhouse with guns emplaced on its flat roof. The blockhouse was surrounded by the palisade and moat with square or diamond-shaped bastions at the palisade's corners. Now this location of San Luis never completely passed from memory. Part of the reason for this is that the fort area retained evidence of the blockhouse and moat well into the 19th century. Several early American accounts reveal that they could trace the outline of the moat and see evidence of the blockhouse. One interesting account is by a man who visited the site in the 1830s and again in the 1860s. Of his 1860s visit, he said that the area was now in agricultural fields and he could no longer see the traces of the fort he had noted 30 years before. The first professional archaeology at San Luis was conducted during the late 1940s by John Griffin, and he established the location of the military complex. He crossed and identified the surrounding moat on the east and south sides. He suspected that some of his excavations were within the blockhouse itself, but had trouble recognizing post hole patterns because of the earlier treasure hunting that took place at the fort. Some 19th century accounts speak of the fort as a place to picnic and dig for treasure. Hale Smith did some minor testing in the military complex about 1950, and during that decade, Charles Fairbanks, then with FSU, spent two seasons working in the fort. Fairbanks set in a concrete marker. It's still there at 449.21 north, 408.83 east on our current grid. And he used it to tie in Griffin's earlier units with his field work. The military complex is one place where we can look at the archeology span of archeology span at San Luis. We mapped evidence of Griffin's trenches in several parts of the complex. His trench that cut through the south moat was very clear. I think we identified a couple of Fairbanks units too. After the state purchased San Luis, the 1984 broad scale testing program revealed a very slight rise on the topographic maps where we believed the blockhouse once stood and large amounts of fired clay were recorded here during the Augur survey. The first modern field work in the military complex commenced in 1990, followed by more excavations in 1993. Between 1998 and 2005, we conducted extensive field work at the fort, excavating nearly all of the final blockhouse investigating the palisade and moat on all four sides, and exposing the four corners of the palisade to map the bastions. Let's talk about the blockhouse first. 
The final blockhouse was a rectangular structure measuring 12.5 by 21.5 meters, or about 40 by 70 feet. While many European-style structures at San Luis have a general northwest to southeast orientation, the long axis of the 1697 blockhouse was at a slight southwest to northeast angle. Contemporary descriptions of the building indicate that it was sheathed with planks or with palm posts backed by clay. Clay was certainly a major component of the structure. We recovered over 16 tons of whitewashed daub and clay rubble from the blockhouse contexts, all of it baked hard by the fire that consumed the building. It seems the walls of the blockhouse collapsed or were pushed inwards since much less fired clay and daub was found outside its wall lines. The only exception to this was near the northeastern corner of the structure. This area also held several post features that didn't seem to be part of the 1697 blockhouse. It's possible that some of those posts belonged to an earlier fortification. The post features of the blockhouse became visible only after we removed 40 to 60 centimeters of soils mixed with charcoal and fired clay rubble. In places, we saw evidence of some of those treasure hunting activities mentioned earlier. The post molds and post holes of the outer walls were quite large, and there were lines of even larger post features in its interior. Many of the interior posts were situated so that they formed lines running north to south and east to west, offering support for many possible partitions and rooms. Just interior of the north and south walls was a line of slightly smaller post features that didn't extend all the way to the eastern end of the structure. The design of our reconstruction interpreted these posts as bench supports. Similar benches for sitting and sleeping were a common feature in Appalachian construction, both in their public and domestic architecture. Since it was Appalachians who built the blockhouse, it may be that one of their traditional architectural elements was included within the king's house. Two of the largest post hole features were located at the west end of the blockhouse. One of the descriptions of the blockhouse mentioned high and low quarters for the soldiers, confirming that it was a two-story building. The two large post holes were interpreted as possible stairway supports, which anchored the stairs to the second story. Now, remember that the palisade and moat were a later addition to the complex, added in the last months of 1702 in response to increasing threats by the English and their Indian allies. The 1705 map shows the palisade as a regular parallelogram surrounding the blockhouse. We traced the palisade and moat on all four sides. The palisade lines were actually somewhat irregular in that they didn't all follow the orientation of the blockhouse. In fact, only the north line of the palisade and moat followed the southwest to northeast orientation of the blockhouse. The eastern side of the palisade ran due north to south along the edge of the ravine. It looks like the lay of the land determined exactly how the palisade was configured. The archaeological signature of the palisade was a set of two wall trenches, and the moat was just outside those trenches. That map from 1705 shows bastions, square or diamond-shaped projections at each corner of the palisade. We mapped these bastions at three corners, but surprisingly didn't find one at the northwest corner. Here, the palisade and moat made a simple turn. 
Another wall trench in this area suggested some other treatment for the northwestern corner. Perhaps a firing platform was raised here instead of a bastion. The moat was profiled, or cut in half, on the south, east, and west sides. It was deep, roughly 150 centimeters below surface, on the east and south sides, but not as deep on the west. The western moat's depth becomes progressively shallower as it runs toward the south. It then becomes well-defined and deep again at the southwest bastion. Since the moat was a late addition, after the Appalachies had become alienated toward many of the Spaniards, it's possible that it was not completed before the abandonment of the mission and province. One historical document mentions a connection between the military and religious complexes. It relates that when the Spaniards decided to abandon the mission, the fort was destroyed and the moat was filled in along with the trench extending to the friary. When we excavated 4 meter unit 457 north, 353 east, there was an extension of the moat toward the south. We conducted a coring survey using a one inch sampler and followed the extension south to the 441 north line where it was still visible in the sampler. A later remote sensing survey suggested the trench extended at least to the 420 north line, which was the limit of the survey. It's possible that the southern extension of the moat is evidence of this late defensive feature. We never noted anything like this sort of trench, however, during the friary excavations. Well, what did we find in the fort excavations besides the tons of fired clay building materials? We'll talk about the palisade and moat first. When these were in place, some of the dirt excavated from the moat was piled up against the palisade's interior as a firing platform. When the fort was demolished in July of 1704, the firing platform soils were pushed back into the moat to fill it in. The idea was to leave nothing that the English might use to their advantage. The ground within the three bastions and at the northwestern corner of the palisade was heavily disturbed. It's probable that the bastions were artificially raised above the surrounding grade, and the disturbed look of the soils within them might be one result of that activity. There was a range of artifacts recovered from the moat contexts, and they should date to the very end of the mission. Like just about everywhere else at San Luis, the most common artifact was Appalachian-made pottery. We located some very large hardware artifacts, a big latch hook and a staple, near the southwest bastion. We recognized an elaborate lock in the moat near the southeast bastion, and there was a musket barrel in the moat there, too. It was the barrel of a matchlock musket, a type of long gun that might have been considered old-fashioned in 1704 when flintlock muskets were the gun of choice. 17th century descriptions mention other structures associated with the complex. We recovered wrought nails along the palisade lines but there was a significant concentration of wrought nails within the eastern moat in the units at 502 north. I think it's possible that some sort of structure was built into the palisade wall here, but we didn't open up enough area to confirm or negate this. The blockhouse deposits contained a wider variety of artifacts than the moat and palisade. We recovered a lot of hand-wrought hardware, nails and spikes, from the blockhouse. Some of the wrought spikes that held this massive building together are the largest we've recorded, and they couldn't be driven like a typical nail. Several gimlets, or augers, were identified from both blockhouse and palisade contexts. A couple were complete examples, but others were just the working ends of them.
The augers are a sort of drill used to begin a pilot hole in wooden posts to receive a dowel or to help start large iron fasteners. We excavated iron keys from both blockhouse and a moat contexts, but there was a concentration of keys and padlocks from the northwestern corner of the blockhouse deposits. They weren't all in one spot, but in that general area, we recovered four padlocks and three keys. The padlocks have different forms, but all are 17th century locks. As usual, ceramics were the most common artifacts from the blockhouse, but there were some differences in this pottery contrasted with that from other parts of the mission. The blockhouse is one of the few contexts at San Luis where imported pottery is more numerous than native-made ceramics. Olive jars are large imported vessels with rounded bases that were used for storage and transport. Spanish storage jars are similar to olive jars, but have a different sort of rim and a flat base. Sherds of both olive jars and this other storage jar were very numerous in the blockhouse deposits. As one might expect, a lot of foods and liquids were being stored within the blockhouse. Majolica, the tin enameled pottery produced in Mexico and imported into San Luis through the port at St. Mark's, was common too. The majolica includes a type known as San Agustin Blue on White, and its production date of about 1700 points to the late date of the final blockhouse. Another imported ceramic type, recognized only at the blockhouse thus far, is faience. Faience is also a tin enameled pottery, but it is French in origin. The French colonial settlement of Mobile was founded in early 1702, and at that date, the French and Spanish were allied against the English. That same year, a captain from San Luis traveled by ship to Mobile in search of help for the city of St. Augustine, which was then under siege by the English. He didn't get the soldiers he wanted, but instead was given flintlock muskets along with some flints and powder. This sort of late contact with Mobile is the likely source of most of the French faience we identified from the blockhouse. Of the native-made ceramics, locally produced Appalachian pottery was by far the most numerous, but non-local ceramics were recognized too. The military complex has yielded grit-tempered San Marcos pottery and pottery tempered with crushed shell. The San Marcos pottery is more common to the east, especially along the Atlantic coast, and its presence reflects contacts with points east, including St. Augustine. Some of it probably arrived through the port to the south. The shell-tempered pottery probably reflects contact with points north of Appalachian province. Pottery tempered with crushed shell was more common along the middle Chattahoochee River, an area known as Apalachicoli. Apalachicoli was important to the Spaniards' trading enterprises, and later on, it also served as a buffer between Spanish concerns and the English in Carolina. There was even a short-lived Spanish fort on the Chattahoochee River in present-day Russell County, Alabama, manned in 1690 by 20 Spanish soldiers and 20 Appalachian warriors. Although we recovered some weaponry items in the Palisade and Moat excavations, like the matchlock musket barrel and solid iron shot, we identified a much wider range of weaponry artifacts from the blockhouse. Parts of both matchlock and flintlock muskets were recognized along with lead musket balls and many gun flints. The great majority of the gun flints are native made, fashioned by the Appalachians of local churches and silicified coral. Fewer of them are typical European style flints. <laughs>
Now this might be evidence of the Appalachian members of the militia who always outnumbered the Spaniards. Some of the Appalachian militia still carried a bow, and small stone arrow points were also common in the blockhouse. A few of the small arrow points were chipped from fragments of broken bottle glass. Musket furniture, the lock plates, springs, and other parts, was one of the few common 17th century items held together with screws. We identified some screws that held gun furniture together, but also found a few examples of what we think are screwdrivers from the blockhouse. One member of the militia, an armorer, was a specialist, and it was his responsibility to keep the guns in working order. The screwdrivers were likely part of the armorer's toolkit. We identified grenades from the blockhouse. They are fragments of hollow iron spheres, some with evidence of a fuse tube. They were filled with gunpowder and would explode when the fuse was lit. The 1705 map of the fort depicts the larger guns that were present in the complex. It notes four-pounder and six-pounder cannons along with wall guns. The weights four pound and six pound, refer to the weight of the solid iron balls the cannons fired. There is a 19th century account of two broken cannons found in the ravine, one of them nearly complete. What we recovered from the blockhouse were small fragments of big guns. Most if not all of the heavy cannons were left behind after the Spaniards retreat to St. Augustine. It looks like they were filled with powder and destroyed. We also found a few examples of solid iron shot, some big enough to have been used with the cannons and other smaller examples that were probably used with the wall guns. There were also edged weapons in our museum gallery is the blade of a rapier that was found in the 1950s during some of the earlier excavations. Most of the blade and sword fragments that we recovered from our excavations don't really look much like swords. We recognized a possible sword handle guard fragment and several pommels, the weighted appendage on the handle end of the blade. An unusual artifact related to edged weapons was fragments of a grinding wheel. The pieces are of a fine-grained imported sandstone, and one fragment is large enough to include its grinding face and its central perforation. An assistant turned the wheel with a crank, and it could be used to sharpen bladed weapons. Grinding wheels are sometimes listed among forge furniture, and it's interesting to note that the only specific reference to blacksmiths at San Luis was related to the construction of the 1697 blockhouse. Smaller blades needed sharpening too. We identified at least two square sectioned whetstones of a very fine-grained stone used to keep knives or daggers sharp. Horses were an important resource for some of the militia, but we didn't find, or maybe didn't recognize, very many artifacts related to them. One element of a horse's rein chain was identified, along with part of a possible bit. Apparently, horses in the Florida missions didn't require shoeing, and we've never located a mission period horseshoe. Closed, cast brass bells were sometimes incorporated into elements of harness trappings, and we recovered several fragments of them. The bell fragments might be evidence of horse harness. We also recognized fragments of other sorts of bells. All but a few were from the blockhouse deposits. Most were pieces of larger open bells that sounded the alarm, signaled the watch, or were rung in the chapel of the blockhouse.
In our museum gallery is a rosary of glass beads linked by metal chain elements. Rosaries were strands of beads used to mark a set pattern of prayers. This rosary was found within the eastern moat during the 1948 excavations. We have identified a few other artifacts from the blockhouse that were associated with religion. There were a few religious medals. Two better preserved examples depicted St. Anthony and St. Anne. There were a couple of faceted jet beads. Jet is a type of very hard coal that was carved into beads and other jewelry items. The cube-like faceted jet beads were often incorporated into rosaries. Another artifact may represent a pin or badge, though there is no evidence for attachment on its reverse. It depicts a skull and crossbones. It might have significance as a military emblem, but I think it is also possible that it had religious meaning. We also recovered another of the silver tridents, much like an example found in the church floor. This one is smaller and incomplete, but there's no doubt that it's another of the halo elements, one of multiple tridents that formed a halo around the head of wooden statuary. Now, one of the rooms within the blockhouse was dedicated as a chapel, and this trident might be evidence that it also held a smaller statue or two. There is another possibility that seems equally plausible. It's likely that the church furniture the sacred vessels, the statues, and the paintings, was moved into the fort for safekeeping just before the abandonment of the province. The little halo element might have been dislodged from a statue taken from the church. We've recovered a slate pencil from the blockhouse deposits, and a fragment of another came from a context a little west of the fort. Slate pencils were used with slate tablets to record changeable information. Slate writing implements are more commonly associated with colonial period ships, but San Luis was very closely tied to shipping through the port of San Marcos. A small quantity of tabular slate fragments was also identified from the blockhouse, and they might be fragments of slate tablets. Some ordinary soldiers probably couldn't read or write, but most officers were literate. It's easy to think that the recording of impermanent information may have been important for the proper functioning of the militia. We identified several artifacts related to clothing from the blockhouse. Aglets were little rolled copper points used on the ends of laces which tied articles of clothing together. Only a few aglets have been found at San Luis. They were less common after the middle of the 17th century, but one was identified from the blockhouse deposits. Toward the end of the 17th century, buttons were commonly used to fasten clothing, and we recovered a few of them too. One button was quite elaborate in two pieces of filigree work, gilded and enameled in red and white, though much of the enameling has worn away. We identified several buckles of both iron and copper alloy. Some were probably used with clothing, but others may have been used for weaponry, think sword belt, or harness. Most were pretty plain, but a couple of the buckles were ornate, cast in multiple pieces that were then assembled. Buckles made like this are relatively late in date, so it makes sense that they were found within the 1697 blockhouse. One very fancy buckle is surrounded by glass or paste settings. One item from the blockhouse has been tentatively identified as eyeglasses. We recovered two circular glass lenses, one intact and one broken from adjoining excavation units. 
They are both slightly heat damaged from the fire that destroyed the building. The complete lens is about 3.6 centimeters in diameter. I didn't realize it when they were recovered, but eyeglasses have a history that long predates the mission period. Medical care is one facet of life at San Luis for which we have very little archaeological evidence. The health of the soldiers was important, however, and one artifact from the blockhouse is identified as part of a clister pump. A clister pump was basically a large syringe used to give enemas and treat certain illnesses. There were a number of glass beads, and they were more numerous in the blockhouse deposits than in the palisade and moat contexts. A couple of the types of glass beads appear to date from the last years of San Luis, again reflecting the late date of the final blockhouse. Most of the beads probably belong to the Appalachies, both the militia members and those women who cooked for the garrison. The soldiers stationed at the fort passed some of their time with games of chance. We have recognized three bone die from the blockhouse excavations, more than any other context at San Luis. There was some archaeological evidence of diet within the military complex, but bone was seldom well preserved and few of the faunal samples have been studied. As in the Spanish village, it looks like most of the soldiers' meat diet came from domesticated animals. Bones or teeth from both cattle and pigs were identified, along with one chicken bone. Cattle remains were recovered from the filled-in moat, and it appears that beef was commonly consumed right up to the very end. Gastroliths, polished artifacts like chert flakes or glass fragments that offer evidence of chickens beyond their fragile bones, were also recognized. At least one gastrolith was a fragment of Asian porcelain, heavily worn and polished. Beyond the domesticated animals, bones from unidentified fishes were recognized, along with bones from turtles. A few of the turtle bones were identified as gopher tortoise. Now it appears the military complex at San Luis served one of its primary purposes. The English or their allies assaulted most of the Appalachian missions, but neither the center of San Luis nor its fort ever came under attack. By mid-1704, however, most of the Appalachians had lost all confidence in the Spaniards and their promises. The Spaniards knew that without the Appalachians' help, there was no hope of saving San Luis or Appalachian province. Well, I hope you've enjoyed hearing about the uh, military complex at San Luis.